everyone. So if you saw my keynote this morning, you saw me talk about all these transactional sagas. I'm going to go into a deep dive on that technical topic in this session. And this is based on mine and Mark's book, Software Architecture of the Hard Parts. We realized as we were writing that book that the really hard part of software architecture really comes down to coupling. And there are two kinds of coupling in software architecture. Static coupling, which has to do with dependencies and granularity, and dynamic coupling, which has to do with how do these things call one another and what forces are in play. And that's exactly what I'm going to talk about today in this talk. So the first thing I want to talk about is service granularity. This is one of the trickiest things that architects face in microservices, which is what's the right level of granularity for a service? Now you may have been told at some point that, well, it should be a single responsibility, the single responsibility principle. But are all notifications singular? Or all customer notifications singular? Or different types of customer notifications singular? You can have a philosophical argument that each one of those is singular. So that's no good as guideline. You need something better. And what we're going to provide for you today are tools now, I don't know any architect that's so smart that they can just look at a really tough problem and the design just falls out of their head into a whiteboard or a diagramming tool. What you need are tools that allow you to create a candidate architecture and then iterate on your design. And that's what I'm going to give you today. Part of your job as an architect is to carry around the toolbox, a, little, uh, a figurative toolbox, and add tools to it over time so that you have ways to address design issues, etc. And I'm going to talk about two families of tools here for granularity. One of them is this idea of disintegrators. Forces that encourage you to break things apart in smaller and smaller pieces but the counter of that are integrators. When have you broken things down too far and you need to bundle them back together? We have five disintegrators and three integrators. And I want to stress here that this is not an exhaustive list because it can never be an exhaustive list. These are sort of generic integrators and disintegrators. It's up to you to take these and put these in your toolbox, but then start looking for specific tools in your architecture that you can also add to your toolbox because every organization has more of these. You just have to discover them and start utilizing them. So let's talk about the five disintegrators. And the first one is the most obvious one, which is service functionality. I need to break things down to the smallest level of service functionality that I can. Uh, and that's the obvious uh, case if you are breaking things down by uh, what happens for, uh, uh, for domain-driven design, for example. So, for example, let's say I have a notification service that has SMS, email, and postal letter. If I go by service functionality, that becomes an SMS service, an email service, and a letter service. This is single purpose and breaking things down into something that's too small to break apart anymore. But this works sometimes and doesn't work completely right sometimes. So when you look at this example, customer service, which includes profile, preferences, and comments, if I break this down, I suffer the possibility of creating a general profile service that handles all customer profiles, and that's a mistake because you don't want that much coupling around a domain concept like customer, so you might create customer profile, customer comments, etc. but this one is a little less clear cut if you should break this down by service functionality because you lose the cohesion of this is all, these are all things that relate to something like customer. The second disintegrator is code volatility. How fast does code change? Because as I mentioned in the keynote this morning, the key to effective reuse is both abstraction, but also low volatility. Because if the thing you're trying to reuse changes all the time, you're creating churn in your architecture. Every time that reusable thing changes, everybody has to stop and coordinate around that change. And so code volatility is a great way to think about breaking things apart. Should this be broken apart so that I can manage the volatility of this particular part of my architecture. For example, let's say I have a notification service that includes my SMS, text, and email, and it turns out that the code almost never changes in SMS and uh, email, 
But because of legal reasons or because of our marketing department, code changes a lot in the postal letter part of my architecture. So that would encourage me to break these down into electronic notification service and letter notification service. Now, my electronic part doesn't change very much and I can isolate that level of change in the letter notification service. Now, this is a great example that there are these little cults that grow up in software architecture. And one of those little mini cults going on, on right now is this idea of volatility-based decomposition. And there are some architects that tell you that's the only thing you should worry about is volatility-based decomposition. But that's not true. It turns out that those people work in a place where there's a clear distinction between things that change a lot and things that almost never change. So that's a really natural disintegrator for them. But you can't universally say that about all systems. It is just one of many tools that we can use to address that. Your code rarely changes, and their code changes a lot. The third of these, we call scalability and throughput here, but this is really part of the family of what we call operational architecture characteristics. Uh, scalability, throughput, uh, elasticity, availability, reliability. These are all the architecture characteristics that overlap with operations and DevOps. And these are important because very often these drive your decisions on, I need one part of my system to be much more scalable than another. And that's an obvious way to break things apart based on how scalable one part needs to be versus the other. For example, let's say that on my notification service, I get 220,000 SMS, 500 email, and one postal letter. That would allow me to break things down into an SMS service, an email service, and a letter service. Now, I might think about looking at the magnitude of this and say, well, you know, email and letter are more or less the same magnitude, and SMS is very, very different. So maybe I should bundle email and letter together, but what would I call it? Non-SMS communication? That's a terrible name. You never name something for what it's not. And so sometimes naming things makes you not want to break them down any further because it just doesn't make any sense to try to break down uh, non-electronic correspondence or something, but that's not a good name either. So naming things in software architecture is hard. The third of these is a special category of these operational architecture characteristics, which is around fault tolerance, availability, reliability, et cetera. Obviously, if you have part of your ecosystem that is more fragile than others, you may want to take action based on that. For example, let's say that I have my notification service and email is frequently breaking and crashing. And of course, if that happens inside my single service, as soon as it crashes, the whole thing crashes and the whole thing is not available. By isolating those into individual services, I can limit the impact of something going wrong in my email service and all the other services can still function perfectly fine. And so reliability, availability is another great indicator of a good way to break things apart. And then finally, the really obvious one, security. Some things often need to be more secure than other things in microservice architectures. And, and that makes obvious sense. So for example, for my security, perhaps I have a profile service that has profile info and credit card info. I could build security into the profile service itself, but sometimes it's better to have a smaller scope for security, less attack vector, et cetera. And so that may encourage me to break these down into two separate parts. Um, Security is always a concern uh, in an architecture like this. And this highlights one of the real advantages of distributed architectures like microservices in that we can have different sets of architecture characteristics at the service level. One service may have much higher security, another service may have much higher level of scalability, and this allows us to uh, suit the service for the kind of capabilities that it needs to support. So those are all disintegrators, and I want to stress, these are all fairly general ones, but there are lots more at your organization. Conway's Law may be a disintegrator at your organization because of geographic distribution of developers or workers between the city or state or country. So you should keep an eye out to find what are forces in my organization that encourage me to break things down.
And a lot of developers and architects get really good at breaking stuff down, but they're not as good at putting them back together. And that's really what an integrator does. When you, should, when you consider that I've gone too far and need to bundle things back together, there are three integrators that we talk about here. And the first of these are database transactions. If I build a system that needs transactionality, let's say I have a profile service and some sort of uh, password service, I want to register a new customer, but then I also need to, to add a password for them. This needs to be atomic. And this is really difficult to do in distributed architectures. Now, I will talk about this and how to achieve this in communication, but generally you should try to avoid this as much as possible, trying to do transactions across service boundaries like this because it's very difficult to get right. And in many cases, what you can do is just say, well, rather than break these down and force myself into a distributed transaction, let's bundle them back together into another service. And this shows you exactly what I was talking about before, about iterative design in architecture. I break things down, but then I find out that I've broken them down too much, and so I use an integrator to bundle them back together, and then I see if there are other disintegrators I need, may need to apply to that because it doesn't quite have the right behavior or characteristics yet. This is that action of iterative design in architecture. The next one of these are data dependencies. This is a really tricky thing because, you know, it's easy to break apart code, but data is much harder to break apart. So here's an example. Let's say I have a service here that talks to five or six different tables. And I decide I want to break this apart into three separate services. The problem, though, is I can't have all three of those services at the same database because I'm not in a distributed architecture anymore. And I haven't gained much advantage by just separating the code and not the data. So what I need to do is analyze who's talking to what. Well, it turns out that service A is writing to 1, 2, 4, and 6 and reading from table 5. B is writing to 3 and reading from 2 and 5. And C writes to 5 and reads from 1, 2, and 3. Okay, well, this is just a, a game of match. So we'll take all four of these and move it over to service A. We'll take uh, number 3 and move it over to service B. And we'll take number five, and move it over to service C, and we're all done. Congratulations. Oh, uh, wait a minute. There are still some lines left over. That's not good. I've got to figure out what to do with all these reads. One of the things that we pay close attention to in distributed architectures is who owns data, who writes to it and updates it, versus who can read it and react to it. This is why caching is used a lot in distributed architectures like microservices. Now, I could have service A just reach across the boundary and query table 5 directly in service C. And similarly, I could have uh, service B query 2 and 6 to read from them and uh, service C query all those other tables. But that's not right. All we're doing is creating a distributed ball of mud here. And if we're letting access to those tables come directly, we're breaking bounded context. And now I don't really have microservices. What I have is a really complicated ball of mud architecture. And that's not what I want either. That's a tricky thing that uh, you have to pay attention to. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, force a little bit later. The last of these is workflow and choreography. Sometimes you want to put together a workflow in your uh, architecture. Let's say I have one big service and I decide I want to break this down into four different services. But now I need to get those four services to do useful work. And now they have to talk to one another over network protocols. Which of these is going to be more performant the one on the left or the one on the right? The one on the left is going to be way more performant because network calls are an order of magnitude slower than internal method calls. This is the Achilles heel often of microservices is that it has performance challenges because I break things down too small and now I'm calling and calling and calling and calling and that creates a huge amount of latency and overhead that causes all sorts of issues in responsiveness and performance. 
So let's say that when I call the single service, I can get it in 1500 milliseconds, but when I call this service and it has to do all these hops to gather data and then return it, I'm now at three times the level of responsiveness that I had before, which is obviously not what we're after in a distributed architecture. Similarly, if I make a request here, and one of those services is down, I have reliability and data consistency concerns. Because what's the state of my data now across all of those workflow items? It may be inconsistent, and that's going to cause me all sorts of headaches to try to figure out how to solve that problem. I'll address that a little bit when we talk about uh, the second part of the talk today. And so it turns out that if you break things down too small, but then you need to get them to do useful work and you create these really complicated workflows, maybe the solution is to bundle them back together and encapsulate that workflow inside a single service boundary. And now you don't have these performance issues, you don't have reliability issues, et cetera. But then it may be too big. Well, now it's time to take another disintegrator and see if I can apply it to that to break it down without creating these kind of workflow dependencies. So those are our disintegrators and integrators. These are forces, tools you can use in a distributed architecture to help you arrive at the right service granularity. And this is what we refer to in our book as the static coupling in software architecture, getting the dependencies and the granularity of the services at the appropriate level. Like I said uh, yesterday, often you're not looking for the best you're looking for the least worst combination of these things. And you can iterate through the design until you find something that does enough of what I need, but without uh, creating more complications. So now let's switch over to the more complicated topic, which is dynamic coupling. Once you have established your service granularity and you're happy with those, now we need to get these things to call each other to do useful work. And this comes to the three primal forces that I talked about in my keynote this morning, communication, consistency, and coordination. Consistency here means, is it atomic? Meaning, does it mimic acid transactions? Because you cannot have acid transactions in a distributed architecture. There's no isolation. You can't get the four properties of acid, but you can model atomic behavior. In other words, you can write code to say, well, in a workflow, make sure programmatically that everything happens or nothing happens, which mimics the idea of transactionality. That's consistency. Now let's talk about communication, synchronous versus asynchronous communication. So here are two examples. This is an example of posting a message to a blog somewhere. And I'm going to do an a asynchronous call and an asynchronous call. I'm using REST here to represent synchronous and a message queue to represent asynchronous, although those are really just implementation details. For my synchronous call, I want to post a comment. So I post a comment, it takes 50 milliseconds to get over the wire. My comment service takes 3,000 milliseconds to update its data and post your comment, another 50 milliseconds to return. And so that is a 3,100 millisecond round trip uh, 3.1 seconds to do that. Now let's switch to asynchronous. I want to post a comment. It posts to the message queue, 25 milliseconds, and I'm done. Comes back to the user right away. It turns out that we talk a lot about performance in architecture, but what we almost always mean is responsiveness. Because I haven't increased the performance of anything in this architecture yet because this is still going to go and spend 25 milliseconds to get over to the comment service, there are 3,000 milliseconds to update my uh, blog, and then eventually another 50 milliseconds to send it back. So I haven't changed performance at all, because updating performance is hard. Getting better responsiveness can be much easier if you use asynchronous communication. But remember, everything in software architecture is a trade-off. This looks magical, but where's the trade-off? Well, let's say that, and, and the thing that exposes trade-offs very often are error states and boundary conditions. So on the happy path, these both look great. But what happens if I type in a word on the comment that's not allowed on my blog? In the synchronous case, 
my comment service will identify that and send an error message back to the user and say, hey, you tried to post something inappropriate to my blog, you can't do that. But in the asynchronous case, I'd have lost that request response cycle. Now I can always create another message queue and have the comment service post to that message queue, let the user interface listen to that message queue, but now I've got to figure out how to react to that because the users are already off doing some other stuff. So maybe I pop up a message dialog that says, oh, by the way, the comment you tried to post three seconds ago won't work. Or maybe I can't figure out how to do that, so I'm not going to bother. I'll just send them an email tomorrow and tell them, hey, you tried to post something that I wouldn't allow. So it's more complicated to get that level of responsiveness, but sometimes it's worth doing that to increase uh, the uh, appearance of performance. The third of these primal forces are distributed workflows. There's my primal forces again, and we're talking here about coordination. Should I use orchestration or choreography for my workflow? This is a common question in microservices. How do you get good guidance on this? Because both options are possible. Orchestration uses an orchestration service to coordinate across several services. Now, I should definitely mention here, we don't want global orchestrators in microservices. No enterprise service bus, no single orchestrator component somewhere. You want an orchestrator per workflow. So for every orchestrated workflow, you'll have a service that just pays attention to that workflow because a global orchestrator like an enterprise service bus, couples everything to everything else, and that is the exact opposite of the goal in a distributed architecture like microservices. Or you could just skip that entirely and use choreography. These, of course, are named metaphorically. An uh, orchestrator is named after an orchestra, which has a conductor. And the conductor does several things. It manages the timing of all this stuff, but it also manages state and other useful things within that workflow. Choreography, of course, is named after dance, and it's a really good metaphor because notice the dance is planned beforehand. They're not just up there flailing around. They know what their steps are, but they don't have someone directing them like an orchestra does. So let's talk about the distinction between these two. So I have several services here, an order placement service, payment, fulfillment, and email and I have an order placement orchestrator, which happens to be my state owner for this workflow. This is one of the advantages of having an orchestrator. You have a convenient place to put state. Now you'll notice it has a database and persistence, but all it's persisting is information about the workflow. Each of the domain objects is handling the things for its bounded context and the important things uh, that it needs. So let's say that somebody like Mark places an order for a book. He goes to the order placement orchestrator. It then goes to the order placement service and says, would you please place an order for me? Okay, that's fine. Now I can go to the payment service. Oh, and tell Mark, hey, your order is placed. Now I can use synchronous or asynchronous communication to go to the payment service. And notice I'm in the created state in my orchestrator. Once it's been paid, I can update that state to a paid state. Now the orchestrator can, knows the next step in the workflow. Now I need to go fulfill this order. And now when that comes back, I change my state to order shipped. And now finally I'll notify Mark, hey, congratulations, your book is on the way. And I can clean up the state of my orchestrator and my order is complete. But I want to look at a couple of error conditions and boundary conditions here, because that always exposes the weak spots of these kind of workflows. What about the case where my, I am backordered? Well, I'm already in the payment applied state. Now when I go to fulfillment, it tells me, hey, sorry, we're out of that, no more items. Well, now I have to go to my orchestrator, and now I'm in the backorder state, so it has to email Mark and say, hey, sorry, your book's going to be delayed for a little while. And for the time being, I'm going to refund the money that we took from you. And so now the orchestrator has to go to the payment service. Would you please undo that order that we had to fix that up? 
and that's the backorder refunded state. So here are the communication paths used within my microservice architecture. Oh, that's good. Uh, notice that for the error and boundary condition, I didn't have to add any communication points. All the communication points I needed were there. I just reused them to manage the boundary condition and the error condition. So let's look at choreography the opposite of orchestration. Here, Mark is going to access the order placement service, which will place that order, update its table, and then say, okay, Mark, your order is placed. Now it'll asynchronously chain over to the payment service and say, would you please apply that payment for me? Once order is paid, it goes over to the fulfillment service. Would you fulfill that for me? And then it goes to the email service and says, send Mark an email telling him your book is on this way. This looks great. So simple, so easy, because this is a kind of a linear workflow. And this choreography just matches that exactly. So this is exactly why you hear a lot of developers say, oh, you should always use choreography in microservices because it's a lot simpler. But you haven't found the trade-offs yet. So let's look at the error conditions here. What about my back order problem that I talked about before? When order paid happens, fulfillment says, nope, sorry, back order. Now, fulfillment service has to send a different message to email saying, hey, sorry, we're back ordered. And it has to send a message back to payment to say, would you please refund this for my customer? And now my error workflow also needs to send an email to my uh, email to say, yes, we've refunded your order. Now, and then update my uh, fulfillment service for my error workflow. Notice that I've had to add all these additional communication points to make this happen. And not only that, in my orchestrated version, my domain services can be dumb and happy. They don't even have to know they're in a workflow. They're just managing their bounded context and the orchestrator asks them to do stuff and they do it. They don't know about any of the other services. They don't know about workflows. But this complexity doesn't just magically go away. In fact, it gets even worse because at this point, Mark calls up the company and says, hey, I ordered a book several weeks ago and I haven't heard anything. Where is it? How do I query the state of this workflow? I don't know. It could be lost in messages somewhere. It's really hard because there's no real state on it. So one thing I could do, and what's commonly done here, is to make the front service the state owner for the workflow. This is called the front controller or front orchestrator pattern that a lot of people use in choreography. But this just makes things more complicated because now every time I get some sort of error condition, I have to link back to the state owner to get state updates, which means that all these things have to know about my state owner and my order placement. And notice that now each of these services have to know a lot about the workflows they are collaborating in. And if payment service collaborates in multiple workflows, all the logic for all those workflows have to be in there. So now my service is getting way more complicated because it has to understand all the state that the others didn't have to know in orchestration. Notice all these additional communication points I eventually had to add because of these error conditions replicate the communication points I had in orchestration. Choosing orchestration versus choreography doesn't make your workflow less complicated. It just changes the way you have to manage things within that workflow. That's important because implementation can never reduce the complexity of your problem, but it can make it a lot worse, as we'll see in just a moment. So what this is, of course, is a set of trade-offs. Because everything in software architecture is a trade-off. You'll be saying that phrase in your sleep after this conference, if you've listened to me and Mark a lot, that everything in software architecture is a trade-off, because we say it all the time. But it's true. So use choreography if responsiveness is really, really important. 
if scalability and throughput are important because orchestrators can become bottlenecks, and if you want better fault tolerance because you have fewer services that might be down or broken, and so that gives you some availability, uh, some uh, better options for that. But if you have complex workflows, you're much better off using an orchestrator because that complexity has to go somewhere and it's really nice to put it in an orchestrator and not affect the domain services and add all that extra workflow complexity into them. Error handling is much easier because you have a mechanism in your architecture designed to handle errors and recoverability is better because now you have state, a clear state owner and it can manage state for that workflow without doing a whole bunch of complicated stuff. Okay, let's tie all three of these forces together and talk about transactional sagas. One of the insights that Mark and I had when we were writing the Hard Parts book, because we, we were trying to figure out something useful to say about transactional sagas that hasn't been said before. But, and so we built all these example workflows to try to figure out, well, what can you safely change without affecting other stuff? And then we eventually reached the conclusion there is nothing you can do that won't affect the other stuff. That's why we call these the three primal forces. And what we realize is that these are in a three-dimensional conjoined space. That you can't change one of these without affecting and breaking the others. You always have to treat these as a group, not as a single thing. This is the mistake we were making. We were trying to say, well, let's change it from sync to async and leave the other stuff in place, but then all the trade-offs change. Of course, that's what we're about is analyzing trade-offs. The reason we think we're kind of on to something interesting here is if you take the distributed architecture out of the equation, what do these primal forces look like for a monolithic application? Well, monolithic application is synchronous, atomic, and orchestrated. So a monolith would appear exactly on the 0, 0, 0 origin here. It's only when you move to a distributed architecture that you have to start taking these primal forces into account. So let's look at that. So Mark and I decided, well, we have three binaries. So we're going to do all the combinations. If you know statistics, combinations, and permutations, that's two to the third power, eight possible combinations. Now, in uh, Chris Richardson's microservices pattern book, he borrowed this, this name of a saga. This predates microservices. The, the saga name originally came from uh, using uh, distributed transactions across databases. Chris Richardson adopted it uh, for microservices, but in his patterns book, he only talks about two sagas, an orchestrated saga and a choreographed saga. And we realize that's not enough. And so we model all eight of them because these are all types of sagas. We gave each of them sort of a whimsical name for the kind of story it is. And I explained where these names came from as I walked through these. As I mentioned, there are eight possible of these epic sagas. I'm going to walk through each one of these and show you the happy path and the error state and talk about some trade-offs for each one of these, where you might use it, where you shouldn't use it, and what the forces that can elaborate and contribute to that system are. And this, of course, is the combination of primal forces. So we'll start with what we call the epic saga. Each of these has these sliders at the top that indicate what the setting is. So the epic saga, all the sliders are pulled all the way to the left. This is synchronous, atomic, and orchestrated. So I have an orchestrator there. I have my three services there. So let's look at a happy path. A request comes into my orchestrator. It makes a synchronous blocking call to one service, which updates itself. Synchronous blocking call to another service, which updates itself. And then a synchronous blocking call to the third one, which updates itself. And then finally, it can send the request back to my user. Let's look at the error path. I post a message, synchronous call to uh, my domain service, synchronous call to another domain service. But now when I try to update the third one, I can't for some reason. Inconsistency, some problem. Now the orchestrator has to go back and do a compensating update for the other two services to get them back in their original state because the dotted line you see there is the scope of transactionality. That's what atomic means in a workflow like this. I want everything in that workflow to either work or not work and not leave it in an inconsistent state. Notice that 
if during this workflow, if I reach this point where I've just encountered an error in this workflow, before the orchestrator has had time to do the compensating update, another service queries this domain service from outside this workflow, they're going to get back delta minus one. In other words, they're not going to see that that change has happened yet because the orchestrator hasn't resolved this yet, and so they're going to get that old value. Now, either that domain service has to keep track of that old value, or maybe the orchestrator keeps it as part of its state. That's an implementation detail, but that's what it means to have an atomic scope for your entire workflow. So the epic saga is named it because it's a long-running heroic story. Long running being the key there. If each domain service takes one X to update, how long does it take this workflow to run? Three X. Notice what you're spending almost all of your time in this workflow doing is waiting for that request response synchronous call to resolve. A lot of waiting in this architecture, which is why we call it a long running heroic uh, story. This mimics a non-distributed transactional interaction. So correspondingly, this is the first attempt by a lot of teams because they're trying to mimic what happens outside of the distributed architecture. And that transactional coordination really drives coupling really high. This one is easy to understand, but really difficult to implement correctly because of all the compensating updates and all the state that you have to manage here. So for each one of these, we have a scorecard here over the left of the four forces that we notice change the most as you change from one of these to the other. So when would you use something like an epic saga? Well, this is, as I said, often the first attempt by teams because they're used to non-distributed architectures, and so they try to mimic this in an architecture like this. It's useful in environments where each step must be completed before the next step starts. So if that first domain service updates something and needs to send that to the second service for it to do its work. So think wizard interactions where I fill out a form, a page, and I need to fill out another page based on the input of that page. I have to have that synchronous communication so that I can get the results before I can move on to the next one. So this is really useful in places where uh, you want... Uh, uh, order of operations, strict order of operations, and where absolute transactionality is way more important than responsiveness. And you'll notice here, coupling is really bad in this architecture, and so is responsiveness, and scalability is terrible. You can see why scalability is so bad. You're doing so much waiting in this uh, particular uh, workflow. So wizard style interfaces or stage transactions are the appropriate use for the epic saga. So for each one of these, I'm going to take one of the sliders and move it across. And so now let's look at the fantasy fiction story where I'm going to take synchronous communication to asynchronous communication. And this is often the first attempt because you create an epic saga and then you're stunned at how slow it is. Wow, this takes a long time. And then somebody in your team says, well, I've read that in microservices, if you want to increase performance, you should go asynchronous. Okay, well, let's do that. Let's move the slider over to asynchronous and see what happens there. Notice here, I make a call to my orchestrator, and it can do all of that at the same time with asynchronous communication. And maybe do these out of order. So in this workflow, if a domain service takes 1x to execute, how long does this workflow take? 1x. This is three times faster than the epic saga just by changing from synchronous to asynchronous communication because I can do more stuff in parallel. In the error case, oops, I went too far there. In the error case, I send messages out to these services. One of them has an error and sends a message back, but it's still in the process of updating the other two. So it's going to still update the other two and then have to go back and do the compensating update for those guys to clean them all up before I can send a message back to my user. Notice that the atomic scope means I've got to make sure all these things are cleaned up before I can tell my user what happened. You may be familiar with this idea of the eight fallacies of distributed computing. These are mistakes everybody makes when they move from non-distributed to distributed uh, systems. This is a list coined by Peter Deutsch in the 1980s. Mark and I have been slowly adding to that list of eight things 
And one of the ones we've added here is that the fallacy that compensating updates always work. Because they don't. It's not magic. Sometimes it might fail too. That, that's, because, that's why if I have an atomic scope, I've got to make sure this all gets cleaned up before I can send a message back. Otherwise, I may be in an inconsistent state. So this is a complex story that's hard to believe in the end because of all the asynchronous, you may get race conditions and deadlocks, etc. Moving to asynchronous communication will improve performance, but now introduce concurrency issues, which may be worse than the performance problems, particularly if you're not experienced with concurrency and asynchronous communication. That can be really tricky. This is often the first attempt at fixing an epic saga Noticeably better responsiveness due to concurrency, but still a single red dot. We'll see the secret to responsiveness and improving it for real in just a second. This is not a good fit if the order of operations is important because this is all going to be concurrent. Things are going to happen out of order, so this is suitable for non-ordered workflows. Why isn't responsiveness better here? Now, it is better than the epic saga, but not significantly for reasons I'll get to in just a second. So let's move from fantasy fiction to fairy tale. We're going to slide synchronous back over uh, to uh, communication back over to synchronous, but now move atomic over to eventual consistency. And notice where the scope of my transaction has landed. The dotted line is now around each individual service, not the entire workflow. That's what eventual consistency means in an architecture like this. So on the happy path, I send a request, we're back to synchronous, so these are synchronous blocking calls. Another request over here to my domain service, and a third request for my happy path. See, even the animation in this workflow takes a long time. You're bored waiting for this workflow to finish because it's so slow. But there's a notable difference in the error case here. I make a synchronous call, I make another synchronous call, when I try to make this one, it fails, but notice my orchestrator can immediately return to the user and say, hey, I'm sorry, we couldn't finish your workflow, and then go back and update the other domain services. This is what eventual consistency means. I don't force consistency during a workflow, and there may be inconsistencies for a small amount of time while I'm trying to fix up those transactions. Notice that here, if during this workflow I reach this error state right here and another service queries this domain service, they're going to get delta back now. Because we're in an eventual consistency world, I'm only worrying about consistency at the service level, not the entire workflow level, which is a significant difference in this one. And this is about uh, consistency. So a fairy tale is an easy story with a pleasant ending. This is, in fact, what Chris Richardson called his orchestrated saga. Uh, so this is the orchestrated version of his saga. Synchronous and orchestrated are the easiest ones to reason about because you don't have to worry about concurrency and some of those uh, evil beasts. And notice, responsiveness has crept up to a yellow, which is really hard to see here, but now complexity is much better and scalability is a lot better now. By getting rid of that atomic around the entire workflow, I've significantly improved the characteristics of this architecture. This is well suited for most medium to complex workflows that don't require extreme scale or elasticity because an orchestrator can become a bottleneck because it's a single point. Now you can always distribute that, but that's complicated too. This is the orchestrated uh, saga featured in Richardson's Patterns book. And this is probably, if any of these would be the default, this might be the default, and there's a good reason that if you're only going to show one of these, he showed this one because this one is more or less the default. And notice now, finally some green in my chart around both scalability and uh, complexity. It turns out this is the least complex of all of them because it's easy to reason about uh, concurrency, uh, or rather uh, synchronous communication and eventual consistency. So the last of the orchestrated versions is what we call a parallel saga. So now I've moved communication to async, I've moved to eventual consistency, but I'm still using the orchestrator. Here, just like we saw before, in an asynchronous case, I can do multicast and let those things update themselves more or less in parallel. And return to my user, 
In the error case again, you'll see that as soon as I realize I'm in an error state, I can immediately return to the user and then go back and fix up those things in the background. Now, because compensating updates may not always work, you may have to have another contingency here for what happens if I can't fix up those uh, other parts of my workflow and my data is in an inconsistent state, but that's an implementation detail. So a parallel saga, multiple stories running at the same time. Orchestrator allows for really complex workflows and concurrency, which gives you really good uh, responsiveness. Notice that they're all green except complexity. But this is pretty complicated. You've got concurrency issues, but this is a really attractive option for complex workflows at high scale. Remember, I said that orchestration is really good for complicated workflows because it gives you a place to store state and to manage the orchestration of these workflows. And so really complicated uh, workflows benefit from an orchestrator. But like all asynchronous solutions, this is really difficult if the ordering of updates is really important to you. As you go through these, you start getting a feel for what drives complexity in an architecture like this. And you'll notice coupling is now a single green dot because two of the three coupling drivers are now minimized in this architecture. Those are the things that drive up um, a coupling and complexity. The complexity here is due to the concurrency problems because you may have a real headache getting all the order of operations right. This is a classic example of a workflow that works great in a developer environment and you put it in production at scale and it breaks in a brand new exciting way every week. So if you're really after job security as an architect where nobody else wants to touch your workflow, this is an awesome option. Because it'll break in interesting ways all the time, and now you've got to go do forensic debugging to figure out, well, why did it break this time? That's a common occurrence with this architecture. So we had to put these in some order, so now we're going to look at the four choreograph solutions. So we'll slide choreography over to the right, move consistency back to atomic, and communication back to synchronous, and create what we call the phone tag saga. I don't have an orchestrator here, so this all has to happen with choreography. So in the happy path, nope, wait, I went too far there. Went too far for my happy path. Here's the happy path. This, because I'm using synchronous calls, is very much a kind of a chain of, of, of events pattern. Because I make a synchronous call, it blocks and waits. Another synchronous call, it blocks and waits. And then finally, I return the result to my user. For the error path, I make a call. Notice that first domain service is still blocking and waiting for this thing to resolve. I get an error state, it follows the path back up, and now I realize I'm in an error state, and I can return to my user that we have an error. We call this the phone tag saga because it's like the kid's game of phone tag, where you whisper in one person's ear, and they whisper in the next person's ear, and the next one, and then you try to find out what the story was when it was finished. That's kind of the way this is, this chain of responsibility kind of a workflow. This is basically the epic saga minus orchestration. And wow, a lot of red on this one. This adds more scalability to tra transactional workflows when the orchestrator becomes a bottleneck. But this is really uncommon because it's kind of weird to do choreography and synchronous communication. You almost always do choreography and async. The only reason you might do this is if you have a choreographed solution where order of operations is important. This one has to finish before this one, before this one. And so that would be the legitimate case for this. But this is one of the less common ones. A weird combination of forces up here. And you can see why this is not very common. All those red dots there is not a good sign. So one of these has to be the worst, right? This is our horror story saga. This is asynchronous communication, atomic consistency, and choreography. So why is this so bad? Well, so here's the happy path. And actually, there are multiple variations of this because I'm using asynchronous. I could do a kind of a chain like this and then have it listen on a message queue for my domain service and not follow it back up. 
Or I could have a case where I'm doing multicast or a chain of responsibility kind of thing. And also the option of letting that third domain service actually return to the user and not go all the way back to the first one because I don't have that request response cycle I have to complete. Or of course, because it's asynchronous, I could do multicast. So all of these are legitimate ways to implement this particular workflow. But the error path is where this one gets really tricky. Because a domain service, another domain service, I get an error and I need to follow this back up. Now I can do multicast there to notify everybody that they need to do compensating updates. So this is more responsive than the synchronous version of this. But notice the real nasty complexity here for this one. Because this is all asynchronous, everything's happening all the time. And so if I'm in a workflow like this, I post a message here, and during this workflow, another message comes in to update something else. And then another message while this workflow is running, and another one, and then finally, a request comes in that is contingent upon the outcome of one of the other transactions I'm still pending. If you really like juggling, this is a good architecture for you, but at this point, your head will explode trying to figure out what order are these things happening in, what's, ha what's completed, what's not completed, how many of these do I have to keep pending because of transactions that are still running in my architecture. That's exactly why this is a horror story. Unless you think this is not that common, literally six weeks after Mark and I had come up with this taxonomy, the project I was working on, the architects brought to me a candidate architecture, and it was the horror story. And I'll tell you exactly how they got there. We need really extreme scalability. So we need choreography and asynchronous, but the business told us it had to be transactional. Congratulations, you've landed in a horror story. But this is why this analysis is useful. Because if you haven't gone through this analysis, you just plow right into this workflow and then figure out you can never get it right. There are so many ways this can break. You'll be chasing this for months and years to try to resolve all the concurrency and deadlocks and race conditions, particularly at scale that this architecture gives you as a gift. Trying to achieve atomic workflows without a coordinator with concurrency layered on top. Workflow, error, boundary conditions, and transactionality have to all be spread out around those domain services, making the domain services really complicated and really stateful and have to keep track of each other and what the pending state of transactions are. Really, really much more complicated. The selling point for this is only so-so performance coupled with impossible to reproduce errors. So if you're really after job security, this is the workflow for you for sure. And this is really an anti-pattern, the strongest anti-pattern of any of these. This is likely a well-intentioned attempt to achieve high performance with atomicity, but there are other ways to do that. And unfortunately, this is not uncommon at all. This is the most difficult option for all three sliders and putting them all together creates the most complicated workflow. And look at my scorecard there, yikes. Not good. So there are two more of these. A time travel saga, which does uh, choreography and synchronous communication. So chaining to each one and then updating and then chaining back to return to my user. Air conditions are similar here. I call my domain service, call the next one, call the next one. If there's an error update, I can chain back across that series of communications that I had before and fix stuff up. Notice here though, I can from the last domain service send a message to my customer saying, hey, sorry, we're in a state, I'm gonna fix it up for you, but notice that we're in an error state. So this is at least more responsive than some of the similar ones. This is a problem that moves atomically through time. Difficult to build complex workflows because you don't have an orchestrator here but we do have some green dots here. It's not that complex, though this is suitable for synchronous event chain pattern like chain of responsibility or pipes and filters that need staging or additive workflows. Uh, and this is uh, simpler than using asynchronous for the same kind of thing. Easier to reason about, no atomic transactions and fewer bottlenecks, 
because no orchestrator. And then finally, the last of these, I went too far there, is the anthology saga. Anthology is just like the one we saw before, but it's using asynchronous. This, in fact, is Richardson's choreographed saga, asynchronous and uh, choreography. And here in the error state, again, I have multicast capabilities here because everything is asynchronous. So when I get to an error state, I can now broadcast both to my caller and broadcast to the two uh, domain services and clean things up as quickly as possible. This is a loosely associated group of short stories. This is Richardson's choreographed saga, and it is the polar opposite of the epic saga, all the sliders in the opposite place from where it was before. But notice a lot of green here, especially around complexity and scalability. The complexity mark comes here because of asynchronous, which is hard to reason about. So this is best for non-transactional pipes and filters, really highly scalable due to a lack of coupling. So you can see why Chris Richardson chose this as his choreographed. And this is the least possible amount of coupling in your architecture, which is why it has such high scores. It's useful to go through this exercise of analyzing all of these because you can compare their scorecards to each other and it gives you a feel for what drives up complexity, what drives up uh, interesting forces in architecture. Because you may have heard, well, you really shouldn't use orchestration in microservices because it drives a lot of bad behavior. And sure enough, I have orchestration there and I have a lot of bad behavior. But look at this one, the Parallel Saga uses orchestration, but it's got a lot of green. This is exactly Mark and my insight, that you can't just look at orchestration. That's not what's making the Epic Saga so bad. It's the combination of orchestration and atomicity that's making it so bad. You can never consider one of these things independently. You always have to think about them together. There are, of course, hybrids that you can create. So, for example, in the Epic Saga, uh, with all this synchronous communication, which is really, really slow, if I get to an error state here, it would be kind of crazy for me to use synchronous communication to clean this up, because that's just making things that much worse. And so I can easily use asynchronous communication to do compensating updates here. And so hybrids are always possible here. So let's talk about one last option, transactional sharding. Here's a scenario, high volume concert ticketing. We have lots and lots of people all happening at the same time because the big band goes on sale and now everybody needs to buy tickets, but it needs to be transactional. Sharding is looking at the domain characteristics and trying to build scalability around that. So if I look at my arena, I need some transactional unit of work, but fortunately, I have a lot of them, these seat sections. So what I'm going to do is create a microservice instance for each section of seats, and each of these services transactionally owns all of the seats in their section. No distributed transaction. All the transactionality is a domain service, and each one of these can own, you can easily scale to 50 seats in a particular section in an auditorium, and it just works. But what about I want to be able to see all the available seats. Well, each of these services, as it sells a seat, populates a cache that shows you what's left in your architecture. And now if a user comes in and says, well, I landed arbitrarily in, in the 160 uh, shard, but I'd rather go to 208. 160 will just transfer ownership to 208. Now, you may lose that seat while that transfer is happening. That's eventual consistency, but that is a way to solve that problem. This shows you some of the forces at play when you start thinking about things like transactional sagas and communication in distributed architectures. And hopefully this gives you some insight into how to analyze these things and how to find one best suitable for the problem you're working on. Thanks very much. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope it was useful.